working? I, can you hear me? Oh, oh, fine. Great. Okay, so I, I will start by showing an extract of a video from within this project I'll be taking as a case study and example. And from this, my presentation and talk today will unfold. So please, the introduction of this, the first two uh, couple of sentences or paragraph, I will contextualize and explain further. And for now, I just let you enjoy this video.
stop it here so I don't uh, lose all my time on uh, watching the video. Um, okay, so what we saw here was one of 70 concerts that happened in the frame of uh, Within. And Within uh, is one of the projects, uh, or the project I s chose to, s to speak about today because it really reflects my take on what is, for me, composition today. Composition in a very broad sense, not only musical composition, but composition in a capital C, in a way. And in my case, myself, I come from electroacoustic music and uh, from the music world, but I work more uh, in conjunction and in the uh, realm of uh, visual arts. And so my work is very performative, but it also takes the form of installations, of uh, spatial pieces that call upon uh, activation and different, uh, different forms of activation and different audiences and participations. And actually the idea of within is to, uh, say, is to see what can we learn and unlearn on the act of listening and hearing and also on the facts of holding concert situations uh, and their parameters of conducting, uh, playing together, improvising, uh, setting up an audience and performance situation. So to revisit all these parameters out of conversation and collaboration with uh, uh, hearing impaired and deaf people. And so this was the starting point. I was very curious at some point of working with uh, deaf people on their perception of sound and how they understand this phenomena and live with it in their daily life, whether they are profoundly deaf and don't hear anything, as in the case of Robert who was conducting this piece, or in the case of people who lost their hearing with age or due to, due to an accident and who have partial loss of hearing. And for me, there was something very crucial and interesting here in terms of revisiting what uh, what is this uh, sensorial act of uh, of hearing and of course when we talk about sound and deafness the first thing that comes to mind is bass and vibration and physical sound and sound that is felt with the body but this is kind of just being on the surface because things I have found out uh, throughout uh, the process of this uh, project were like very mind opening and incredible to me in terms of what this means and I will give you some ideas and get back to this uh, later on but anyways in the case of within the collaboration started in Sharjah, a place in the United Arab Emirates, close to Dubai, in a school for the deaf that has children between, I think, 8 and 22 years old from different origins and different countries and different sign languages. And it was like work over several years uh, that little by little took me to different places. I will not, <laughs> it will take too much time to describe all this, but the, 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 the work w with this collaboration, the idea of making instruments that could be played and felt by a hearing and a deaf audience started to come out. And what we saw here in the video is actually an instrumentarium of so far for the moment, I think 12 to 14 instruments that were built by different profiles of people in different parts of the world and different like uh, uh, institutions, but all starting with the question uh, that I, with the question that I asked to different profiles of instrument makers and researchers and speaker companies of what is an instrument that would address a deaf and a hearing person, and so the instrument is the tool of this composition or this project uses these instrument for this pur for the purpose of this exploration. What can we learn and how can this change our habits as composers and sound practitioners and performers in doing things? And actually, um, the composition for me, or my composition, is uh, creating this set of instruments or this instrumentarium. At least that was my main contribution as artist, musician, and author, a composer and author of the project. For me, the first maybe compositional act in, uh, most important compositional act for me in this piece is to create this instrumentarium where all the pieces complement each other and create like a coherent body. Uh, and then that would allow a multiplicity of compositions to happen in a second stage. And this type of idea and this type of approach came to me because I was very much influenced by the work of Cardew and the Tretais at some point were like really mind-blowing and crucial for me because I started to wonder, okay, what 
gesture can one have after uh, card use? And once the score and its possibilities have been exploded and expanded to that much, what are we left with today in terms of uh, the potential of a piece to be reinterpreted, reappropriated, and to, uh, to, to mutate over time, and where the will of the composer is not imposed neither on the audience or on the performer or on anyone who's invited to work on this piece. So that was like a constant thought I had in mind, and this is where the idea of the instrumentarium came as a very pertinent answer, because it's already a series of, po or, or like a body of sound that is orchestrated by me in a compositional gesture, but then uh, that allows me afterwards to invite a multiplicity of composers with their aesthetics and way of doing and way of working, uh, and then to uh, they, that create and for them to create their own pieces. Now, on within, there is always a crucial parameter and condition. There is no concert that happened, or at least well, a few happened maybe this way, but there is always this concern of putting together deaf people and hearing people and having them share a stage or share a platform or a momentum, whether it is a workshop, a rehearsal, a concert, a discovery session, you name it. And this act of putting uh, deaf and hearing people together happened on several stages of my composition. So first of all, for building the instruments, for example, these instruments were not just done in context where I went to an institution like Ikhkam or the Electronic Music Studio of Stockholm or to the Berkeley University or to Meyer Sound and ask them what is an instrument that could be played and heard by a deaf and hearing person, wait for their answer and give them the green light to build it. No, on the contrary, it was sometimes asking these people this question, getting an answer that would be a maquette, a drawing, uh, an idea, and then going and executing it with the concerned audiences and publics in different contexts. So what we are seeing in this image, for example, is, oh, and sorry, I'll open several of those, is a situation where I ask this question to sound artist and musician Thierry Madiot, who has an experience of working with deaf children in the suburb of Paris. And I told him, what is a percussion instrument that would be a table? or like, can you imagine a percussion instrument that uh, would fit uh, my concept and just draw it to me. And he indeed t told me you can take uh, springs, metal rods, and make a percussion table where you take a big uh, piece of wood and try to plant these elements in it and get the best vibrational result where you can hear the sound in the wood much more than in the ears. That was his instruction. And I took these instructions and I went to a high school for deaf children in Bergen, Norway, and I spent several months with them on building a such table. So I brought like just an empty uh, MDF cheap uh, uh, maquette, like an uh, uh, empty surface, and we started from one session to another to build it together and to think, okay, what, uh, what could this be? And it created a first maquette after several sessions, and this maquette then I took back to a professional instrument maker this time. I said, we have this and this and this idea. Can you now make something that is much more solid, much more ergonomic, uh, um, beautiful, uh, well, uh, with a good finissage, and that would honor the idea of the students, but that would also uh, allow a multiplicity of other people to play it, and that would also not be something that is scary or that looks very virtuous, uh, like that, that looks maybe like a piano or a violin or something that is intricate and complex and where you need time to, uh, uh, how to say, to uh, get a sound out of the instrument, you see, like with the trumpet or anything, where you could get sound immediately, where the relation with the instrument is immediate and where the instrument has the potential of breaking the psychological barrier of a person who has who doesn't hear sound, who sometimes or most of the time grew up with the idea that music is not for them or a music instrument is not addressing them and who are very much afraid maybe of performing 
either in a closed environment or much more in an open environment in front of an audience in the public on a situation like we, so we saw in this video. So this was also one of the parameters that, was, that were crucial in building those instruments is of making them user friendly and of making them uh, with a, a learning curve that starts with a very immediate uh, response from the first encounter with the instrument and that has a uh, great potential of uh, being developed, affined, and tuned in relation to the, to the uh, musician's uh, sensibility and uh, motivation to, uh, to, to work on this project. So these instruments, each of these instruments that we saw in the video has a story of uh, this nature, whether a workshop or a round table or a series of discussions. And at some point, what we saw in the video and what we see in this picture, all these instruments from different parts of the world came together into an abandoned swimming pool in the city of Bergen. And that was my proposition as I was as the artistic director of an art triangle there that happened two years ago uh, called the Bergen Assembly. Uh, these instruments converged to uh, Central Badet, the uh, public uh, abandoned swimming pool. And instead of the water that was in the pool, kind of the pool was filled with sound and vibration. And the instruments we came up with were not all dealing with bass or with like physical sound somewhere, and like had, could even be very, very powerful as we heard a little bit here, but some actually worked with idea of tactile sound. So like the idea of this table where you put your hand on the surface and you can feel the sound in the hand before receiving it to the ears. Or some worked with ideas of um, uh, uh, visual uh, sound understood from visual stimuli, like you saw with uh, this person who is playing marbles on the surface of uh, an amplified drum. And for example, this person is totally deaf, but she can project the sound out of the movement of the marbles, or at least this is something very crucial I learned from uh, uh, deaf people, and I stopped using the word hearing impaired, actually, because I find it very incorrect and much more like uh, they hear, deaf people hear, but they don't hear with their ears. They hear with their eyes, they hear with their skeleton, they hear with their body and with sign language, but they, they hear, they're not impaired in that sense. They just hear differently. And so um, in, uh, in, in, in this case, uh, the, the movement of the marbles uh, was uh, a form of uh, listening, and there is also listening from sign language, as we saw with Robert, who is conducting the piece, and who, uh, well, there are, sign language is very poor in terms of describing sound and giving sonic indications, but people who use sign language have a very big uh, capacity of uh, creating uh, visual codes, like pre-signs, we call them, like they're not part of the vocabulary of sign language, but they're a code within a small community that is shared, and that signifies something. So <coughs> pre-signs and also this idea that, well, we can, can maybe see it in the case of Robert, this kind of visual polyphony where Robert is able really, because this is how also sign, sign language and com, uh, sign communication happens, is able to follow what four or five people are doing at the same time. Like he is really capable, like his uh, angle of sight is wider than ours and he has this, uh, visual ability to process a polyphony of gestures at the same time and then be aware of what musicians are doing uh, just from looking at them from uh, with, the, uh, with the corner of his eye. And th those are some of the examples I, 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 I can give you. We can, we can expand much more on those. But then the, once these instruments were created and that they all came to Central Badet, there was a second layer of uh, composition or of participation uh, for, for me, like there are lots of common points in these two notions uh, where we started to have open sessions. Like we, we put a, a call for participation on the channels of deaf associations in the city and in the country to say, there's a music project in Central Badet. If you're interested in discovering what it is, please come on Thursday afternoon between four and six. Uh, Tarek is giving a presentation session where you can try these instruments and see if you would like to take part in this project or not. You know. So we had plenty of these discovery sessions where people like individually or in asso with associations 
uh, came and yeah, I showed them the instrumentarium and they tried it. And if they were interested, they would they could come back on other days and work more with these instruments and then decide if they would like to be part of one of the performances and the concerts and to work with one of the composers I was inviting to this project, such as Pauline Oliveros or Gerhard Stabler or Alwyn Pritchard, and there were many. And so um, this, is, this is like a, a second uh, layer for me. And then for the audience, when this uh, project opened, they could come to the exhibition space and Okay, this is the pool actually I'm telling you about. And the instruments are around the pool and also mainly inside. Oh, oh, no, no. So I'll show you a few. This is, for example, the uh, what happened to the idea of the students uh, with the percussion table using metal pieces and its final outcome. And so what, what would happen when the audience and not the musicians enter the space of uh, this pool? They could hear a sound piece that the instruments are playing. So it's a sound piece uh, that is uh, sometimes uh, playing on instruments that are automatized. So some have a computer processor inside of them and they are playing. Uh, sound on their own and the sounds they are playing come from uh, recordings of pre previous performances or sessions that happened on these instruments. And to hear this piece, you don't just hear it with the ears, sometimes you have to get close, touch one instrument because it's vibrating on itself, or sometimes you have to sit on something and feel the sound like in your, uh, in your body. In other cases, you have to watch something and see its movement because you don't hear it really well instead you, uh, unless you amplify it with a microphone or a contact mic. and it, push the volume. So there is this level of relating with the work as one possibility and I call it, what I, it's what I call also a ground zero, like another layer of composition within my composition where I set the ground or the floor of, okay, this is the instrumentarium and this is what it could do or one of the scenarios it could do. And then inside this pool there is also a mediator, somebody who is there in charge of hosting people and this mediator speaks sign language and also speaks, uh, uh, is hearing, is not uh, totally deaf. And I give institutions the possibility to do two things. Either you can play my sound piece and then people come sh listen to it like this when there is no rehearsal or performance happening. Or you can also have the mediator stop the sound piece and take people on a guided tour and explain the instruments one by one, show them how they're played and have a discovery session like this. And for me, the two things are valid. And depending on the context, sometimes I show this project in environments where there, there is no mediator or person of this profile or where finding a mediator is difficult or is not available all the time. So the sound piece is an alternative. And if not, mediation. And for me, both uh, like yeah, are valid. My, my piece is not the composition I made into which I'm very attentive and to say, oh, this is my sound installation and we should not touch it. It's like the, uh, the sacred thing. <coughs> it's really up to the mediator and to the institution who are, uh, who's inviting the project to, to decide this out of conversation together. And then the second thing that, the, the another layer of composition that can happen within this, outside of these discovery sessions and visitors coming is the, the, the of course, you can imagine lots of workshops and of schools coming uh, for guided tours, uh, schools for like uh, uh, deaf uh, kids or, or hearing ones. But there are also a lot of rehearsals and activations that happen in the regular times of the exhibition. So to give you like some figures, I think like in Norway we had about 150 performers over a month or maybe, maybe about like 120 over a month. And the rule for me was simple. If you decide to be, uh, if you would like to be one of the musicians on the project, then you have access to this swimming pool all the time when it's open and even outside of these times if uh, possible. And you can come work on any of the instruments you would like to play, provided that we have taught you how it works and 
uh, what uh, what you could and could not do with it. So once you get these the set of minimum instructions, the floor is yours, and you can come and rehearse or do whatever you feel like doing uh, to uh, to get acquainted with the piece. The second thing is the rehearsal process. So each invited composer has also got the possibility, let's say, to uh, have rehearsals that are open to the public or close to the public, depending on their approach and what they would like to do. And therefore, with, with such very simple rules and uh, principles, the exhibition space came to life without any stressing on, uh, without any discourse about like, oh, making a live exhibition. Or it all felt very natural in the sense of a process taking place where every week throughout this month we had three commissions that were presented like uh, by different composers. The commissions were between, I think, 15 and 20 minutes uh, each, more if the composer would like to, to do. And they worked with uh, sometimes very scripted uh, pieces and that used, used uh, systems of graphical notation. Even some had like audience participation in this kind of German uh, uh, contemporary music school uh, of the composer giving instructions to the audience who makes sounds in one part of the space. And, uh, and then uh, others were very much improvisational, so had like very simple structures of uh, uh, like timelines and scenarios of combination of instruments and people. And then what was happening inside was much more uh, on the spot and, in, and improvisational. And what I liked a lot, or at least in, in that's my own taste, sorry, is pieces that were instructional or that created very simple situations that had lots of potential, like this video with Pauline Oliveros, where she worked with Robert, who was a painter and profoundly deaf and had never worked with music or instruments before, but he came to one of these discovery sessions and said, wow, this is great. I can learn a lot from it and it can maybe affect or change my perception on painting. So he came every day to work on this. And at some point he was like, okay, I would like even to conduct. I'm open to conducting. And he started talking to Pauline about how conduction usually happens in, uh, uh, in the hearing world and to develop his own gestures of how he would like to communicate with musicians. And then rehearsals happened where he kind of started to execute these uh, this vocabulary of gestures and it got him to, to this level after I think like four, four days of work. Uh, so it was really quick because like the ground or all the elements for this type of emulation or synergy to, to take place were already provided in a very simple and natural way. So it wasn't a situation like the one of a white cube where you had to be uh, very uh, careful or cautious about uh, the artwork or the sound environment or, the, or something like this. It was much more uh, uh, hands-on. Although these pieces now have a status of artworks and are part of collections of museums and institutions that treat, treat them like this, but there's a, a lot of thinking and like there is a, a big emphasis in an approach like this one on uh, the project being, first of all, uh, musical and sound project uh, that uses these instruments as tools. So these instruments, uh, so that's something I'm very, very cautious about, do not become sculptures that abide to the rules of visual arts in terms of conservation. We were talking with some of you about transportation, about uh, preservation and accessibility. Uh, my piece is not the instrument. It uses the instrument as medium. My piece is something else. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what is uh, convened and what is agreed on with uh, the, the, the institutions who collect this or who uh, want to keep it for uh, posterity. And then maybe one of the final questions here is like, well, wh where, is my, or where is all this going in a certain way? Okay, we made an, we made an instrumentarium. There are, uh, until today, composers uh, invited to write pieces for it. Uh, there are uh, mm, people from uh, different uh, ages and uh, experti levels of expertise, whether amateurs or professionals or uh, uh, totally deaf or hearing, uh, working on it. But that's, uh, for me, that's not enough. Like, that's, uh, all this is great, and all this is, again, like another platform for which, from which to learn. So, 
again, in this composition, or in my idea of composition, the final outcome is not the moment of the performance or the moment when we go on stage and present something and say, okay, this is when it's all happening and when it all comes together. No, this, this moment of being on stage or of presentation is also part of the experimentation and is also part of uh, knowledge building and learning to take things further. So, for example, in Pauline's case, or like in many, many people's case, there is always an idea or something to take, and this thing to take is, uh, is, is for me the one to be documented sometimes, much more than a, a video or uh, an audio recording or uh, uh, a, graphic, uh, a graphic score. These for me are sometimes just like the accent, like the the side, uh, like the collateral uh, results of an initial idea or of a core idea that is to be preserved. So for me, also like this idea of like living art or that art that is always moving or changing shapes, uh, the idea of documenting it or or fixing forms is a bit dangerous, and that's something that also comes from. Um, well, some of you here know it or heard me speak about it before. This, uh, this notion, uh, this idea in Arab uh, culture where a lot of the heritage in poetry and in music is oral and not written or scripted. Uh, and that's a will that was there like from centuries uh, in terms of having uh, forms and a heritage that could adapt to its era. Like for example, in Arab uh, music, uh, melodies or like themes uh, were not written on any piece of paper. They were taught from teacher to, to musician uh, because one of the ideas was that in a hundred years from now, if the instruments changed and if the sonorities change, uh, we could still play this melody. While if we write it in relation to an instrument, it will get stuck to it and it will not have the possibility on updating itself or renewing itself. And those, those types of ideas were really fundamental to me in terms of uh, how to preserve these pieces or what is to pass on to the coming generations. So a video like this one, uh, I, from a performance of, let's say, I don't know, 20, 25 minutes with Pauline, I kept eight minutes because I didn't want to keep the whole performance because otherwise I was afraid that it becomes like so crystallized as, uh, as, as a scenario that we try to reproduce it in the future. It's not about reproducing this. We, I don't care about reproducing it. I don't care about reproducing uh, a, a scenario of improvisation I set up in a given situation because I was working with people who had this level of disability or this motivation to play that instrument or something of human interaction that happened on the spot and that could happen in so many, so many other ways in other situations and conditions. So all these things that are a result of human interaction, of working in situ or responding to a situation for me are sometimes not part of the piece and should not like change the piece or uh, give it shape. Sometimes they do, but in the context of this, I was very keen on really going to the essence and to synthesizing the most. So what is next in, a, in an approach like this one at the moment, I would say uh, the coming step in my big compositional scheme is maybe a book, you see, a publication uh, that uh, on one hand um, gives the possibility to rebuild those instruments and maybe not to the identical, the way, they, the way that I built them, but that for each instrument tried again to go to the core of the idea, like the percussion table. What is important about this percussion table is the fact that you can hear it first with the hand before hearing it with the ears and that it propagates sustained long sounds that are the result of metal and wood in contact with each other. Now, how the metal and the wood are laid on the table, what is the, the nature of the wood, uh, the nature of the metal, this is secondary. And so the object that came out of it, in my case, is unique. I made it one time. If I'm to let people reproduce it again, it's not about bringing an architect and having him 3D map the table and say, this is how it should be redone. No, on the contrary, it is about trying to synthesize those the principles I told you and passing them on to an instrument maker, to a high school for deaf children maybe, or to, the, to a concerned audience to rebuild the, the piece uh, for the future. So a publication that has 
elements like those that allow for the instruments to be rebuilt in different shapes and different contexts while they're core or, uh, by transmitting their core idea. And also a book that uh, maybe tries to synthesize lots of uh, pedagogical or like training exercises like a, a small etude or situations of playing differently than, than usual. So how we can work with a percussion instrument uh, in the case of uh, like a, if, you are deaf, if you are hearing or deaf, how we can work with a string instrument, how we can work with uh, how can a conductor uh, work with uh, an audience that uh, has both uh, deaf and hearing people. So these ideas for me are very important to kind of synthesize and have <coughs> within a piece like this. And even if this book, well, I, it, it will see the day because I'm working on it at the moment, but uh, it's still not the piece, you see, or it's still not the end of the piece. The piece doesn't end there in a way. So, and at, at the time being, I'm really wondering, okay, so where does it end? And do I like this openness and open format that has no end? I think I'm feeling more and more comfortable about it, you know? So kind of this also dilution of uh, my gesture w within this, you know? It's like, okay, wh what is the artist's, like to, to want to control it or like to script it as a master plan, you know, like the big architect does, is the big architect is also maybe not important because uh, as long as the project finds its channels and its way to infiltrate um, schools for deaf people who want to work with music, conservatories who want to make programs between deaf and hearing people, uh, musicians who want to learn from this project to create something different from uh, uh, what they usually do or to work differently on their own instrument, all this are possibilities for the project to exist and that I should not try to have control over or like a maitrise in any possible way. And also there is this important notion in a piece like this one of when you create an instrument or when you build something of this nature, an instrument has always got the capacity of going outside the project or the boundaries it was created in. Like you build something with a purpose, sometimes, sometimes you build an instrument because you have an idea of a sound you want to use inside a composition and you make it for this composition, but it has the capacity to outlive your composition and to exist in, in, in other realms and conditions. So that's an important observation as well about letting go or not wanting to have control on a project like this one, this idea of appropriation. The way I understand it or the way I see this instrument is maybe very different from how a composer or someone would understand it if we are to take all to take out and erase all the parameters that led to its making. So, uh, yeah, like that's, uh, that's uh, I, I, I will stop here. Maybe in the questions and, uh, and the q and I'll go back towards more details and things you would like to find out more about. But in a nutshell, yes, this is, this is what the act of composing is for me today. Or at least this is what I learned from musical composition is this sensibility and know-how of putting things together. Uh, and putting them together, not just, not, it's, the way I learned how to put sound together within a spectrum or on a timeline, uh, I put uh, know-hows, I put people, I put uh, competences, uh, uh, worlds together to, to create these things. And that, that for me, yes, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it if I hadn't learned musical compositions as such. If I was coming from visual arts, maybe I would have worked in a very different way. Uh, but uh, but yes, it's for for me like so sometimes to to come up with a plan like this one, I sit down and I script things as writing a visual uh, uh, a visual score of a piece actually, and then the plan uh, is there and it changes of course along the way and with the encounters and things that happen, and ideas like these ones are really not doable in a year or two years like a project like within I've been doing it so far for six years and I think it will. It's one of these things that can go on for a whole life if you want to. You see, if you want to spend time with it, you can spend a lot of time with it. So voila, that's it for now. And I see you back at the Q&A.